so um, I'm going to be speaking about women's magazines and basically why they should be making us happier. Um, so, right, there we go. Um, basically, I occasionally need a really trashy magazine. And when I do, it's Cosmo, um, unfortunately. Um, and I think with Cosmo, everyone who reads it, um, the first bit they turn to are the sex bits, basically. Um, because these are the fun bits. The rest of Cosmo is not necessarily that interesting. Um, <laughs> so this is me flicking through a recent, um, a recent issue. They've got a Fifty Shades of Grey inspired feature here. Um, some clothes. There we go. Um, and then we've got the, um, the bit where they kind of analyse men. Um, <laughs> So, and they've got a little mini interview with Dominic Cooper. Um, and of course, they had the, oblig the obligatory oral sex tips, which every single Cosmo has. Um, so, and I also had a quick look at a copy of More as well, just for balance, basically. Um, so, <laughs> so, this was a feature about um, mothers and daughters who share sex tips and, you know, sex toys and things like that. Um, and it went on for about three or four spreads. Um, and they also have things that aren't about sex, like this was a, um, this was a feature about people who work in a zoo. Um, <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I didn't read it. Um, so I think the, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make about women's magazines is that they're actually very tempting and very fun. Um, and you buy them, well at least I buy them, because um, you somebody just want something that's just totally mindless and relaxing. It's the same reason as, you know, watching trashy TV, basically. Um, but I think what I find when I've kind of consumed a Cosmo um, is that they always leave me with something to worry about. Um, I think, just to flick back, I think one of the kind of, one of the bits that kind of stays in your head and um, isn't always helpful are these, these statistics. Um, I'm not going to kind of you know, uh, bore you by reading them out. But, um, but I think they, there's an element to which they're actually quite... Um, I almost feel they're like, you know, a friend who you get on quite well with and, you know, they're always nice to you, but they're actually not very good for you um, at the end of the day. So, yeah. Um, so I think... I think it's kind of, this is fairly well-worn ground. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, complain about women's magazines a lot. Um, and the other question is, really, that I think I should tackle is, why in the age of the internet, magazines are even still relevant? Because there's so many different sources of media, and um, some people don't really buy magazines at all. Um, and I think just my answer to that really briefly is that magazines have a way of getting under your skin. Um, so I think they're not, they're not really the same as a book or a film or another kind of piece of media. Um, you know, you buy a book because you want to read that book, whereas I think people buy a magazine because they're having a coffee and they want to relax, um, and they're treating themselves a little bit. They're very, they're almost an ultimate lifestyle product. Um, and I think because of that, they kind of, they have this, they have this way of getting under your skin. And they almost, if you, if you read a certain magazine regularly, it starts to become, it starts to feel like a home. Um, because you, say you read it every month and it's part of, your day, part of your routine and it's something you come to look forward to um, and almost rely on a little bit. So I think um, in um, about two years ago, um, I and some friends launched this magazine called O Comely. Um, and the reason we did that is because we had a feeling, or at least I had a feeling, that there are lots of women who don't really feel at home in um, mainstream women's magazines. So I think that was the point of launching this, and we wanted to do something that was a bit, um, a bit more generous and more honest, and that kind of told people stories and inspired them to be creative and things like that. So um, I've just got a few spreads of it here. Um, so this was a feature where we asked illustrators to draw imaginary maps. So this is the, of a map of Eden, and we also had someone drawing a map of uh, the area underneath their sofa. So just kind of playful features um, like that. Um, oh, this was an interview with a really interesting woman who um, was the founder of Roller Derby in the UK, and that's a really violent sport on roller skates, which you should definitely look up. Um, yeah, and this was just... Uh, just 
to show you a couple more bits. Um, that was from one of our fashion shoots. Um, and I think when we launched Ocumly about two years ago, the magazine felt very much out on a limb in terms of where we, in terms of the rest of women's magazines. I remember kind of we pitched it to various distributors, and it was very hard going because they were like, okay, what you know, they want to sell it, they want to know which titles to compare it with, and there really wasn't very much in the UK at that time that was that was directly comparable to Ocumley. Um, and the, the really interesting thing about what's happening in women's media, and actually in the media in general, is that it really doesn't feel like this anymore. Um, and I just wanted to talk you through a couple of like, interesting magazines that are primarily aimed at women, that are also doing something very different from um, your classic trashy glossies. Um, this is The Gentlewoman. Um, I expect some of you have probably heard of it. Um, they were one of the first magazines to put Adele on the cover. Um, and I absolutely love this cover because it's, um, it's just really fantastic. She looks really grumpy, she's smoking, and she's just got this, uh, it's just got this amazing striking quality. And I would say that The Gentlewoman is probably aimed at people who are a bit older than O'Comley, so probably about in their 30s, um, and they've got these fantastic interviews with strong women, like they've got this, this interview with Tilda Swinton um, here. And they also, um, this was a really interesting fashion shoot because they photographed lots of, I, th I don't think they were models, they were women from the ages of 20 to, to 40, um, topless, but I really enjoyed the way they subverted the kind of stereotype of topless women in magazines. Um, and they did it in a really honest and kind of, uh, yeah, anyway, I just thought it was, I thought it was an interesting variation. Um, and this was, one of, this was one of their more playful features, where they um, photographed different magazine editors applying their makeup on the tube. Um, <laughs> so this was their own editor. Um, and I think the funny thing about this feature was actually that a lot of these editors um, don't even use the tube anymore. Um, so <laughs> but that was just quite funny, and I think it's... It was a symptom of them not taking themselves terribly seriously, um, which is always nice, actually. Um, this is another one Molly makes, which is a, totally different again, but it's very crafty. Um, but it's a crafty lifestyle magazine, so um, it's not too heavy on the craft, and it's a lot about kind of nice interiors, thrifting, um, you know, nice afternoon tea. Um, and... I also thought I should mention a kind of a real forerunner of this, which is an Australian magazine called Frankie, um, which has actually been around for about six years. Um, the Australians somehow are kind of ahead of the UK in this. They've got a really interesting magazine market, which you should... Um, yeah, definitely Australian magazines are worth investigating. Um, so this is just some spreads from Frankie. Um, this is a... I'm just trying to remember what this is about. Oh, this is a, a little kind of personal piece about dancing like no one's watching. Um, this is, you know, they've also got some of, some of the same kind of interiors feel that something like uh, Molly Makes does, but here they are interviewing some... I think it's a designer's house. Um, another really great one, which I wish was in English, is Flow magazine, um, which is based in the, in the Netherlands. Um, the fact it's got English on the cover is really tempting, but actually the whole of the inside of it is in Dutch. So um, I've been getting copies of it for about a year, um, and I still have no idea whether the writing is any good. But um, they, they're, they're, they give the impression of being a really great magazine, anyway, <laughs> from the design. Um, because they do things that are really great with the paper, like they have little kind of notebooks you can pull out, um, and things like that. Um, I also think a mention should go to Rookie magazine, uh, which is not actually a print, uh, a print magazine that's online, but that's a really great um, magazine for teenage girls, which is a kind of online journal, um, which is started by Tavi Gavison, who, or Jevison, I'm not sure how you say her name, um, who is a really famous 15-year-old blogger. Um, so I think um, there's been a lot of interesting things going on in media for women, Recently, sorry, I kind of got to the end of my visual bits. Um, so I think these launches, all these, all these launches that have happened recently, tie in with a kind of a wider cultural trend in our culture towards um, a feeling of nostalgia, a kind of rejection of consumerism, um, and this sense that 
people want a little bit of peace and quiet and a little bit of um, something a bit a bit less frenetic because I think there's a there's a kind of frenetic energy to um, to some women's media, you know, you must have this, you must have that, and you need to follow these tips or else things will go wrong. Um, so I think there's been a real trend in our culture generally towards this, this sense of calm and seeking that. Um, but I actually wanted for kind of briefly to sit back and question this because um, I think there is a danger, and, you know, I'm talking to myself as a magazine editor as well as anyone else, that this sense of calm just becomes another commodity so if you think about, them, about magazines from an advertising point of view, which is really important, you know, say Cosmo is encouraging you to buy, or rather Vogue probably in this case, is encouraging you to buy a kind of overpriced Gucci handbag and you know, a more kind of nostalgic magazine is encouraging you to buy um, an overpriced faux vintage film camera. Like, it's, it's arguable that there's actually not an enormous amount of difference between the two. Um, and I think the danger I've seen with some of these nostalgic magazines is that they, um, they allow you to buy a piece of something calm and nostalgic, or you know, some, some magazines allow you to buy a piece of activism in your life. Um, and it really is just a kind of... It almost becomes a sticking plaster. So, you know, when you... I think one of the reasons people buy Vogue, for example, is because it gives them a piece of, a piece of that glamour and a piece of that... Um, that sense of fashion in their lives, and I, I think there is there is a strong there's an argument to be made that this new trend of women's magazines or this new trend in our culture can just as easily become commoditized as as before. Just because it's not mainstream, it doesn't mean it can't be consumerist in its own way. So I think the central point I'd really like to make is that actually the way that magazines make a difference or the way that people as consumers make a difference in what, in what they buy is not through taste, but it's actually through the sincerity um, behind it. Um, and I think perhaps more interesting than um, these launches, you know, including of O'Cumley, is that actually there's a new, there is a new feeling that people are after sincerity. There are some really great magazines out there that are very sincere and that they're, they're totally passionate about what they're talking about. They care about their readers, they respect their readers. It's like there's an excellent food magazine called Fire and Knives, which is just really passionate writing about food by, you know, chefs or restaurateurs or food reviewers who aren't writing food reviews or writing that's pigeonholed into a, into a format, but they're just, they've just been given space to talk about what they love. Um, and it's just really, really fantastically written. Um, on a totally different end of the scale, there's um, a magazine called Knockback, which is a direct, hilarious parody of things like Cosmo. Um, it's a small zine. Um, you mainly buy it online. And it's just this really funny, punchy, uh, witty, feminist little um, publication. And I would really love to see some more magazines that are sincere and they care about their readers and they believe in what they're saying, but that have this sense of silliness. Um, because I think... There are some really great independent magazines out there um, and some great ones that aren't independent as well. But the sincere ones tend to be made by serious people um, and they tend to take themselves seriously and that's always a danger. And I would, I would really like to have more silly and sincere magazines that, you know, love their readers, basically. <laughs>